Last night we were both two tired puppies. You know, we were ready to go to bed, I'll tell you for sure, after a busy week. Had a great healing school yesterday. You know, we had people from Indiana, from Wisconsin, from uh, Minnesota, Arizona, uh, Arkansas. Yeah, I don't even know where all. Had a lot of people from lots of places. I remember some of them, but praise the king. I mean, I had a doctor come here one time and says, I got to hear this from you. He said, I heard that you had a granddaughter who was in a car wreck that her brain stem was severed. I said, yes, sir, that's what they told me. And he said, who done the test? I said, Dr. Marks, head of neurology at Cook's Medical Center. And he said the brain stem severed. I said, well, yes, sir, he done two MRIs, and both times he said it's severed. And he even said the eyes were jerked out of the brain. But I just stood on God's word and believed God couldn't put it back. So I said he did. And he said, that's impossible. That was a misdiagnosis. So there was no way if the brain stem was severed and the eyes were jerked out of the brain, there's no way that little girl could be seeing and walking and running and talking today. It's impossible. I said, well, one thing we know, you won't never see a miracle like this. <laughs> you know, you got, to, you got to stop thinking like a man and you got to start thinking like the king. When you think like God, what becomes impossible? Nothing. That's right, nothing. So we have to stop thinking like man and start thinking like God. Jesus is so awesome. Oh, and uh, uh, David had a handkerchief there a while ago, and I anointed it with oil and prayed over it. And before you leave today, what I would like for any of you that are people of faith, David's sitting right there, uh, and uh, the, the young man with the glasses on and the red tie and the blue shirt right there. David, raise your hand, David. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> what I want you to ask David O'Toole, and any of you that have real faith that want to see God do a miracle, I want you, to, after church today, I want you to get a hold of him. I want you to lay hands on that handkerchief we anointed with oil. I want you to add your faith with my faith so that this man he's going to go to the hospital with and lay this on will be healed whenever he gets over there. Now, I think about faith, and I think about what happens with this, and I was down in the Beaumont here a few years ago, and there was a man and a woman there, and they had a healing ministry. And there was a woman from England, had a grandson born with no lung on one side and no hip. And, of course, that medicine, the doctors and so forth, the health packages they got over there, you know, uh, they all go to a certain doctors, and the doctors checked out the boy and said, uh, impossible, no hip, no lung. So she said, no problem, he'll have one. Now that's a woman of faith, isn't it? A grandmother goes home and she said, I don't know anybody in England that has this kind of faith. But she said, I know a man and a woman in America that have this kind of faith. So she wrote this man and woman and asked them to anoint a cloth with oil and pray over it and said, I know when I get that cloth, when I lay it on my grandson, he will be healed in the name of Jesus. That grandmother's saying all the right things. She sent a cloth in an envelope to this couple. She said, when we got this, we were awestruck at this woman's faith. So she said, we poured a little anointing oil on it. We laid hands on it, prayed over it, and we asked everybody in the church that wanted to in our ministry that was willing to lay hands on that with us and anoint that with oil and pray the prayer of faith over that. We did that. Said so we put that back in that envelope and mailed it halfway around the world from Beaumont, Texas to somewhere in England. That grandmother got that, took it in, and went and laid it on that grandson. I said, now, Lord, you made me a promise. You said, anything I ask in the name of Jesus, ask in faith, you would do. So I believe with their faith and my faith that you're going to give my grandson a new lung and a new hip. And he's going to be perfect in Jesus' name. She never got into fear, not one single time. At a little bit later date, the boy continued to grow, and it was time to take him back for another checkup at this uh, place where they had to go over there. So when they took him in, the doctor said, well, that's the boy. didn't have a lung and a hip. Said, do some x-rays and let's see. And so they'd done the x-rays and brought him in, and he looked at it, and he said, wrong boy. <laughs> Can't be the same boy. She said, sir, I done the x-rays myself. This is the boy. So 
So the doctor goes in himself and personally x-rays the boy again and looks at him himself and he's perfect. Two perfect lungs, two perfect hips, no problem. Now what is our God able to do? Whatever you can believe him for in faith. Whatever you can believe him for in faith. If you can believe him by faith, nothing is impossible with God. And there's no doubt, we prove that beyond a shadow of a doubt. Many times in this room, people about look all over this room right now, I mean, I think about James and his family and the mighty t miracles we've seen God do in their family. But I look at many of you. Many of you here today, we've prayed for and seen many mighty miracles. I mean, Ernest and his lovely wife shaking their head. Yeah, we, we've been there with them too, haven't we, Ernest? Yeah, his wife was miraculously healed after 15 years. Their granddaughter was miraculously healed. Ernest told me, he told me when he brought his granddaughter and I prayed over her. He said, now we prayed over her, but nothing's happened. He said, I want you to pray over her. So we prayed over her, and the Lord healed her. And only a few weeks or what it was later, his wife said, well, I've had this tumor in my stomach for 15 years. And she said, I want to be prayed over. So she come up, we got her sins repented over, we prayed over her, and the next Sunday when she come back, she didn't have no tumor. So she's been healed. Ernest told me, he said, Thurman, I don't know what you do different, but whatever you do different, I'm going to get there. He said, I'm going to be, if you can do it, I can do it. I said, that's exactly right. God is no respecter of persons. And so Ernest, I mean, he has been studying the word. He comes to church and he drives a long way on Sunday to come over here to church. But he says, every Sunday when I come over here, I go home challenged with the word. He said, I'm challenged. Well, I'm telling you, to live a Christian life is a challenging life. Now, if there was ever a time when you need to pray against the enemy, you know, you need to pray every day. But I'm going to pray right now that, you know, the Lord's going to move. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we realize that we're your sons and daughters. We realize we're washed in the blood. We realize that Jesus is the king of kings. We realize that he has destroyed the forces of darkness and that he is in control of the cosmos. That, Lord, we have absolutely no fear. We're not going to let the enemy intimidate us in no way. We're not going to walk in fear. We realize that from day one, these battles have been going on all the way back as far as we can read in Scripture. The enemy's been there to steal, kill, and to destroy. And this beast has never changed. The only thing is in these last days, he, it appears he's intensifying his warfare against mankind. And Lord, you said that was going to happen too in your word, Lord, but that you will make us, the Christians, more aware of what's going on so that we will go out and do more to tell people about you. That we will learn, like this young man that was up here a while ago that's learned how to walk by faith and seen all these wonderful miracles and healings and other prayers answered in the last four years because he's learned how to walk by faith. Lord, enlighten us all like that. That we can walk in the God kind of love. We can be your children. We can be about your business. And whatever we do and wherever we go, whatever we do, Lord, we ask you to let us be the sons and daughters of yours that will talk to people about you and that we will be bold as lions with the word of God and we will do things that will allow you to do your great and mighty signs and miracles and wonders so that people will know that we serve the King of kings and Lord of lords and God of gods. Father, all these wonderful testimonies we've had today and all the wonderful things you've done for the people we, or all of us in this group, have prayed for and the miracles you've done and the healings you've done and the marriages you've put back together and everything else you've done, we're grateful. And Lord, we ask you to continue to do those things on an increasing, escalating scale. Now, Father, I want to thank you and praise you. So, Lord, we're not going to step in any kind of fear. It makes no difference what appears in front of us we are not going to go to fear because we realize that that's the enemy. And when we step into fear, our faith does not work. So, Lord, we're going to stay in love, realizing that you're the king. We're going to walk in love, and then we're going to see your glory because we know you're in control, and you know what's going on, and nothing catches you by surprise. So, Lord, thank you for being our Lord and our God, and thank you for watching over us and protecting us. And you promised you'd never lead us, leave us, so we know 
you're here. So we just want to give you the praise and the glory and the honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <clears throat> now then, <clears throat> let's go to the Word. Talk a little bit about the Word of God. <clears throat> let's go to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. Praise the Lord. Hebrews chapter 13. I've got a couple of translations here, and one of them's the King James, and one of them's the NLT. The NLT, I, the more I read and study the NLT, the more I like it. You know, it's so clear, and the words are so clear, and I love the NLT. But I, of course, I love the King James too, you know, so, but I, I read a lot out of all, all of them. But some of this I will read, and maybe all of it out of the NLT. Hebrews 13, 1. The first thing the Lord tells us to do here, he says, let brotherly love continue. Now then, in the NLT, he says, continue to love. So this is the thing that our king, over and over and over, stresses to us. We are to continue to love. We're not to get into anything that's not loving. So if we love, and I got tickled at one of the brothers and sisters that are here. Uh, he had picked up a... Uh, DVD and it's husbands love your wives and he didn't realize that it was a DVD and he was going to listen to it on the way home in his car and he put it in there and he said it wasn't play and of course when I looked at it I told him I said well every once in a while we have one that does not record or something but I looked at it and I said uh oh it's a DVD and if you want to listen to it in your car you need to get a CD I said oh my goodness I didn't even pay attention since both of this look exactly the same so he started back there to get one, and his wife said, why don't you get two? <laughs> Did you all pick up on that? <laughs> why don't you get two? Well, what she really meant, she wanted him to have one and their son-in-law to have one. Because just think, this is where so many men in the church fail. The Word of God says, husbands, love your wives. Continue in love. Husbands, love your wives. You know, we, many of us have read that scripture where it's, husbands, love your wives so that your prayers will not be hindered. But you know, we don't really get a hold of that. But if you change the definition or change the words a little and say, husbands, if you don't love your wife, I will not answer your prayer. That makes a whole lot of different, that just as clear as you can get there. So if you're allowing the enemy to get through to you, so that you're not walking in a love walk with your wife, then the enemy has done that to you so that you cannot get your prayers answered. You can pray all you want to. And if you're not walking in love with your wife, the king will not hear your prayer. So you wonder why so many men don't get their prayers answered? You know, men that'll get into a crosswalk with their wife due to some little problem, they're not continuing in love, and then when they do pray and ask God for something and he's like he's deaf and they don't ever see an answer to prayer and then they keep praying about something and nothing happens and they say, God, don't answer prayer. I've heard lots of people say, you know, I prayed and 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 nothing ever happened. Well, if you prayed and didn't nothing happen, then you got a sin in your life you need to get rid of. There's something wrong because when you pray, God hears. And he answers. I mean, you, but, uh, you know, you've got to walk in this love. So if you're not in love, not walking in love, your faith will not work. And you cannot get your prayers answered. You know, so if you'll do it God's way, I mean, God's listening. I mean, I think about, as, as, and I've used this example many times for you in here. Uh, we talk about when James uh, said there a while ago, when he was talking about we had prayed, they had prayed, and a lot of times when James and his family prays, God answers immediately and instantaneously. We've seen that happen. In fact, the first time I met James was right here in this church, and his wife, Lori, had fell and hit her head, and she had been virtually incapacitated for about six weeks. And he came up, somebody at work told him about things happening over here, miraculous things, and he asked the man that told him, said, have you ever seen God do a miracle or healing? He said, well, no, but I understand that happened at the Living Savior Church. 
So James came over here that Sunday and sat and listened to me teach the Word of God for an hour and a half or so, and he came up for prayer. He said, Mr. Schiffner, you sound like a normal human being, but they tell me that miracles happen over here. I said, well, I just believe God, James. And I said, what do you need? And he said, my wife, Lori, is laying at home incapacitated because she fell and hit her head and said, well, had her to the doctor and everything, but they can't find out what's wrong with her. I said, well, Jesus said in Matthew 18, 19, if two of us on earth agree about anything we ask him for, he'll do it for us. I said, now you've got to believe that with me, James. I said, I said because you and me are two and we're on earth. And I said, now the next thing we've got to do is agree. He said, he looked at that and he said, well, I can agree with God's word. I said, okay. So we prayed the prayer of faith. And then I told him, I said, I guarantee your wife will be up. I said, go home and get her out of bed and tell her to walk. So he got up and left. And before he got home, the son that they had left at home to be with Lori had to ask mama to get up and go for a walk. And she said, you know, I do feel extremely good. And so when he got home, her and the little one was out walking and Lori's been healed ever since. So we see God do some wonderful things, don't we, Lori? Lori's sitting over there smiling right now. That's her sitting over there with the baby, the one that we just prayed, or we prayed over the little one. They have four beautiful children and five now with the little one. And like James says, when you see God answer so many times instantaneously, that's like Cheryl and I, I mean, we're walking a love walk with God and with each other. And I've prayed over her so many times since we've been married and seen God do instantaneous miracles, just like we did with Ernest, you know, Esther. Well, I mean, we prayed over virtually an instant deal, wasn't it? Both for, you, you, for your wife and your granddaughter. You know, but God doesn't always do it instantaneously. You know, even my own wife, one of the things I prayed for, he didn't heal instantly. And the next day she still had it and we prayed over it. And after about the third day, of course, you know, she's so spoiled to these instantaneous miracles. You know, when she didn't get it, she looks at me and says, have you sinned somewhere? <laughs> because she wasn't getting her answer. And she wanted it right then because she's spoiled. You know, you girls can get spoiled real easy, can't you? Yes, you really can. And we love it. I love it when God heals your wife like he did. And you loved it too. I know Esther did. You know, but the thing about it, we love it when God takes a tumor away and dissipates it in a, just a matter of a few hours or a few days when she'd had the thing for 15 years. Now, what was a devastating thing about it, she told me about a friend of hers that had the same thing that had went in for surgery. And when the surgery happened, she died. Wasn't that what you said, Esther? Yeah. So she said, I'm not going to have this surgery. I'll just put up with this thing. Well, she had put up with it 15 years, but she didn't know she didn't have to put up with it. But if she could change a few things. And one of those things is our lack of faith. You know, we, we don't walk in the God kind of love by walk, so we can walk in faith. We think we're walking in love. We think we're doing what God says. But when we really get into the Word and see what He requires, See, the start out in this verse in Hebrews 13 was, he says, continue in love with each other. Do you think he really means that? What do you think God put all these wonderful words in this book for? He, he put them in there for a purpose, didn't he? He didn't say walk in love when your wife does something good to you. He said walk in love with her all the time, right, Ernest? And that's what God wants us to do. Now, continue in love Continue to love each other with true Christian love. Oh, now that's a different kind of love. And some people love people because the person is good to them. You know, they may not be Christians. We know people that are not Christians that love each other. But some of them love people for different reasons. You know, there's many different reasons why people love. But this kind of love is a God kind of love, and this love is unconditional. And that's a tough kind of love, to love unconditional. When somebody's not good to you, when somebody treats you wrong, when somebody talks evil about you, you know, whenever you hear somebody comes to church says, Thurman, you ought to hear about what this woman said about you. I mean, she says you're a liar, and you're not teaching the truth, and all that stuff. You know, well, from the flesh side, you'd want to say, well, let me tell you about her. You know? But that's not God's love, is it? 
be the God kind of love, you don't retaliate with those kind of things. You just stay in love. Say, so, so the, the world, the world won't attack you much. It's the church that attacks you. Isn't that a shame? It's the church. I mean, but it, nothing's changed. In Jesus' day, who was his greatest enemy? The leaders of the church. I mean, they were the ones that come against him. I mean, the people loved what he did. I mean, it was only the PhDs back in those days that give him a hard time. You know, so, and it hasn't changed. Hasn't changed. I had a man come to the teaching in uh, San Marcos uh, Thursday night. We talked down there, and wow, and he had, we had a packed house down there. I mean, that church was running over. I mean, with the pastor had to bring in chairs, and they had to bring in chairs and everything. I mean, we had a packed house. It was wonderful, but one of the uh, men and his wife that brought their children, he said, we've been associated with the Bill Gothard Ministries, and said, I got a problem, my wife's got a problem, my children got a problem, and said, one of the men that works with Bill Gothard was telling us about that you spoke at one of his conferences, and that Andy, which was on the platform right then, had received a miraculous healing when you prayed for him. So he said, I caught a hold of Andy. And I said, Andy, I understand you had a tremendous healing when Thurman Scrivener prayed for you. He said, I sure did. And he said, it's still holding. And he said, by Andy working for Bill, and he told me you prayed for him, he said, we drove two hours to come over here tonight for you to pray for me and my wife and my daughter. See, but I told him, I said, sir, you're going to have to do the same thing Andy did. You're going to have to get rid of every sin. I said, that's what wrong. I said, Andy was a fine young man working for Bill Gothard in the ministries, and he was walking in the God kind of love. He was not having any sins. You know what Andy's sin was? I, it took me 45 minutes to find his sin. His sin was he didn't believe the promises of God. Somebody said, that doesn't sound like a bad sin, but it's bad enough to keep you in sickness and disease. Amen. And this young man had been, already had surgery one time in his life, and here he is only 21 or 22 years old, and now he's walking with a walker again. And the doctor says if he keeps working in, I think it was 30 days, if he worked full time in 30 days, he'd be back in that hospital with another surgery. And he said if he worked part time, it'd probably be 60 days. And he, they, but anyway, all of them led back to surgery. When Bill called me and said, Thurman, what do you think? I said, well, I give him the fourth option, and it's Jesus. Amen. I mean, the king. The king's a healer, isn't he? Amen. But you've got to believe. So I go through Andy's life. Are you a Christian? Are you walking in love? You know, are you committing adultery? Have you ever fornication? Have you ever thought about having sex with a girl? No, not, no, he didn't have done none of those things. I mean, he was a great young man to be 21 or 22 years old. Finally come down to the fact, I said, well, Andy, all I can figure is right now from what I've, everything I've asked you, you just, your sin is you don't believe the promises of God. He said, sir, I do believe the promises of God. I said, well, either you don't believe them or you don't know them. And I said, if you don't know them, he said in 2 Timothy 2.15 that you're to study to show yourself approved unto God. I said, you've obviously not done it. He said, sir, I read and study the Bible all the time. I said, well, let me find out. I said, turn over to Matthew 18.19. He turned back one of my favorite verses. I've seen more people healed and set free with Matthew 18, 19 than any other verse in the Bible. And it's so awesome. He turned back to Matthew 18, 19. I said, now read that promise. And he read it out loud. Jesus said, and again, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything you ask me for, it shall be done for you by my Father, which is in heaven. I said, now, Andy, you don't know that verse. He said, I've read that verse. I said, okay, then you didn't believe it. I said, if you had, you could have found another one of them guys up there. Y'all could have agreed together and that devil would have left you and your back would have been healed. He said, sir, you think it means exactly what it says? <laughs> well, you know, you ought to ask yourself that question. You know, because I guarantee we have the same problem today. Because we've had this book for 2,000 years and it's made us these promises. And I mean, I didn't believe them, but you know, if you'd have asked me a few years ago, do you have faith? I'd have jumped up and said, absolutely, I got faith. I have great faith. But now I realize I didn't even know how to spell it. Oh, I could have said F-A-I-T-H, yeah, but I didn't know what it meant. I didn't know how to walk in it. I didn't know nothing about it. 
Now, you know, if you'd asked me, can you drive a car when I was 10 years old, I'd have said no. But when I got to be 20, you say, can you drive a car? I said, oh, yeah. I mean, I'd been on a racetrack. You know, I'd done all kinds of crazy things. You know, I mean, I knew cars inside out, upside down, and backwards. I could build one. You know, I could do everything. But when I was 10, I didn't know that. But when I was 20, I did. You know, but I could tell you back when I was 10, do you know anything about a car? No. But when I'm 20, yeah. But I understood those principles, but faith I didn't understand. So when you asked me 30, 40 years ago, do you have faith? I just said, absolutely. Do you know the word of God? Absolutely. I've read it. I believe it. I've read it from cover to cover, and I believe every word in it from Genesis to maps. But I didn't no more know the word of God than I could fly without wings. You know, I just thought I did. I take this book today, and everywhere I open it to read it, when I meditate on it, just like this one line, so forth, continue to love each other with a true Christian love. Read that, and then back off and let it sink in. That's what you got to do, right? You can't just read the Bible at face value and just read it and read it like you're reading a novel. It will not soak in. You got to back off and say, now, Lord, what do you tell me right there? Continue to love each other with a true Christian love. Well, Lord, what's a true Christian love? You got to think about what is the God kind of love? Okay, that's real easy, Lord. I'll love them with a God kind of love. Oh, you will? Okay. Let's find out if you're going to love with a true Christian love. Let's back up in the scriptures to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We're going to find out if you're going to do what the scripture says. 1 Corinthians 13. Now we're going to find out what true Christian love is. And this is what separates the men from the boys or the ladies from the girls. This is the true definition of the Christian kind of love. And this will teach you that it's virtually impossible for you to walk here. It's not easy. I get, when you read this, you're going to find out it, when the Lord told us in Hebrews 13 to continue to love each other with that Christian kind of love. This is what he's talking about. And you're going to find out how hard this is to do this, even to, at home with your wife and your children or your spouse. Either way, the wife or the husband. It is hard to do this. Listen to what he says. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I am become as a sounding brass and as a tinkling cymbal. You've got to have love. And though I have the gift of prophecy, and understand all mysteries and have all knowledge. And though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, if I do not have the Christian kind of love, the agape love, I am nothing. Boy, you don't count for much, do you? Nothing? And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and I have not the Christian kind of love, it profits me nothing. So if you don't walk in the God kind of love when you get home, how, much, how, much, uh, reward, how many rewards are you going to get? Nothing. You've got to do this God's way. You know? And so when you, let's go on and look, get a little further now. Now let's see what, how, what this Christian type of love or the God kind of love in verse 4 Love suffers. What? How long is long? Oh, okay. If you say something to me and I don't like it, okay, Lord, I'm going to suffer long. One, two, three. That's it. Bam. Is that suffering long? No, y'all don't agree with that either, huh? <laughs> but some of us, that's the way we live, isn't it? We, our suffering long is one, two, three. Maybe not even that long. Maybe we only get to one. We retaliate. I'll get even with him or her. None of y'all ever done that besides me, have you? <laughs> yeah, you see what I mean? This is not easy, is it? Love. Suffers long. Oh, and it's got something else that goes with it. It's kind. 
Love suffers long and is kind. Now, this is the kind of love we're supposed to love each other with. How many of you want to see God's miracles? How many of you know you ain't going to see them unless you do what he says? <laughs> now we know why we don't see many miracles, don't we? Now we know why we don't get our prayers answered very often. Because we're just barely got started. But love suffers long and it's kind. It's real easy to step outside that now, folks. Y'all all know you've been there just like me. But he tells us what to do there in Hebrews 13. And then when he comes over here, it says, Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. It envies, never. You don't envy. Love vaunteth not itself up. Or it's not puffed up, lifts up. It is not puffed up. Love does not behave itself unseemly. Love does not seek its own way. So your wife wants to do something, and you don't want to do it. We're going to do it my way. That's something. That's something. It's hard to do. It's hard to walk there. Very hard to walk there. Yeah. Now, this is the kind of love we're supposed to love each other with. Now, I'm going to tell you, if you read this and you read this and meditate on this, you're going to find out how difficult it is for the flesh to walk in these few verses we're going to read. Obviously, it is an obtainable goal, or God wouldn't have put it in his word. And if we want to walk in his miracles, which everybody does, everybody wants to walk in divine health, then you've got to do it his way. He's the king. So he says, love does not behave itself unseemly. It's, it's very kind and gentle. It never gets wild and screaming. When you start get there, you're out of love. I know none of y'all ever been there but me. I have definitely been there in my life. Ernest is hanging his head too. He knows just like I, me and him both have been there. Haven't we, Ernest? Yes, we've been there and done it. We've messed up. But I got a feeling there's not a single one of you out here that hadn't messed up sooner somewhere along the line. But this is hard to walk in this. It is hard to walk in because the flesh don't want to do anything the Word is telling us here. The flesh wants its own way. It is definitely not kind and gentle, and it doesn't suffer long, I mean long to the flesh. It's three seconds. If I don't get it in three seconds, bam, I'm out of here. You know, I mean, I know the flesh. Love does not behave itself unseemly. Love does not seek its own way. Love is not easily provoked, and love never thinks no evil about anyone. <laughs> Sharon made a face on that one. <laughs> That's hard to do, isn't it, Sharon? Yeah. yeah. We ain't going to think no evil, are we? Nope. This girl says, I ain't thinking no evil. I'm going to walk in love. I don't care what anybody says to me. I'm not going to think evil about nobody. Well, that's the attitude you have to get. Then it says, love rejoices not in iniquity or sin. I have heard Christians say, I don't like that old boy. He may be in church with me, but I make a statement, well, if he keeps going where he's going, that sin is going to bring him down and maybe hurt him seriously. And they say, good, I'm waiting for it. Now, hey, that's not the Christian kind of love. That is not the Christian kind of love. Well, if you think evil or you want somebody else to get hurt because of their sin, if you're voicing that, that's going to come to you. Because you're speaking a curse over them and it's going to bring a curse back to your life. But if you speak a blessing over them, a blessing will come back to you. See? Now that's what we've got to learn. We've got to do unto others that we want them to do unto us because whatever we do to them, whatever you sow is what you're going to reap. 
God will not be mocked. Whatever we sow is what we're going to reap. So it, this is something that never made earthly sense to me when I would read in the Proverbs where the Lord says, a man that gives away liberally will die wealthy. But he that keeps it all to himself will die poor. I thought, Lord, you'd think if the guy's saving everything and not spending anything, he ought to build up a mountain of it. But it's some way or another, it gets away from him. I don't know how it is, but it'll get away from him and he'll die poor. But yet the man that's always giving and helping people, it will always be coming back in. You know, that's why, that's why we don't charge anybody for anything in this ministry. I mean, we don't charge for appointments. You know, we don't charge for healing schools. We don't have no uh, restoration fee for any of the schools. In every, we don't even charge for our media. We don't even take up a church offering in church on Sunday. But yet God pays all of our bills. Amen. Isn't that amazing? Amen. Give and it shall be given unto you. Amen. Press down, shaking together, running over, shall man give into your bosom, because with the same measure you use to give, shall it be returned to you. And God's word cannot return unto him void. Amen. You know, I mean, I had to have a great faith to start giving away a handful of tapes. And there's not anybody in here, not anybody in here knows any more then Marcia over there, how many I give away? <laughs> you know why she knows? Because I buy them from her. <laughs> she loves our, our ministry because she knows exactly how much stuff I buy. But now her company she works for, I have to pay them for them. And, but she does give me a great price on them. I will say that I really thank a lot of this lady. She really blesses our ministry with good prices on this stuff because we buy so much of it. But as she goes over the, that edge and walks in that kind of love and gives, God blesses her and her company, Amen. you know, that she works for. She's worked for them many years. But she knows how many of these things we buy. In fact, here a while back, uh, I forget now my, my uh, tape recorders were giving me a problem, and I bought them all brand new from her. And I said, you know, we're having trouble with some of these things. And I thought they were supposed to be good for at least 25,000 tapes. And so, of course, we had several of them. So she done a little quick check and come back and told us how many hundred thousand tapes we had bought from her. <laughs> and I said, okay, maybe it's time they are wore out. So we had to take them all in and they fixed them all for us. But there again, see, you don't realize how many of these things you're making and giving away until you find somebody that keeps record. And of course, they keep record of how many they sell to us. I didn't have any idea how many thousands of these things we had bought for them. But I mean, we have bought thousands. We're, we're giving away about 10,000 a week. Pretty close. Tapes, cassettes, CDs, DVDs, about 10,000 a week, almost. Eight to 10 nearly every week. That's a lot. That's a lot. But we praise God for that. Then it says, after he says, love, does not behave itself unseemly. Love does not want its own way. It is not easily provoked. It never thinks no evil. It love does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things. How many things? All things. Now, when you don't bear all things, whenever you're out on the job and somebody says something to you and you retaliate, with some really rough words or whatever, you didn't meet this criteria. You know? I mean, Ty and I, all of us as a team, were up in another city just recently, and there was a man and his wife came to us the second day that he had an incurable disease. The pastor told us when they wanted to meet with us that he used to come to church once or twice a month. But after his sickness came upon him, he said they've been in church every service. Isn't that amazing? He totally changed. So when we met with him, we found out that he was a little farmer and he had a business that he sold to oil field people. And as I talked the first night about requirements for walking in divine health, that next morning he said, I know why I'm sick. He said, I have not put God first. Do you know what the first commandment says? You're to put the Lord first. 
You're to love him. You're to put no other gods before him, and he's to be first. If you break that first commandment, you're setting yourself up for sickness and disease, maybe even death. In fact, the Lord says in his law under the old covenant, if you put any other gods before me, you will surely perish. Isn't that amazing? We read this book, but we don't believe it. Because if we thought that if we didn't put him first, then it was going to cost us our life prematurely, or we were going to have sickness and disease for 10 or 20 or 30 years and then die, and all it would take was for us to step over and say, Lord, I love you, and I'm going to put you first in everything. I'm going to study your word every day. I'm going to walk in love. I'm going to do what you say. He said, okay, good. No, no problem. I'll heal you and deliver you. Now let's go on. And you go through all of your life in perfect divine health. Which way had you rather have it? I'd rather have it divine health. I don't want to be sick and afflicted and pain and torment and spend all the money I have with doctors. Do you? Nope. But see... We don't read this book, even as Christians, so we don't understand why we're sick. But God says, number one commandment, love me, but no other gods before me. You're to put me first. I'm to be number one in your life. You're to be nothing before me. Nothing, absolutely nothing. He said, if you do, if you put anything before me, you will surely perish. Somebody said, well, that's under the law. Well, let me tell you, that's never changed. That's never changed. You've got to put the king first. I don't care if you're a born-again son of God filled with the Holy Ghost and power. If you don't put him first, he will not share his power with you. He's got to be number one in your life. If you want your prayers answered, you've got to be seeking him and putting him first. If you're seeking him, putting him first, then that's the first step of all these steps of criteria that's required to see God do miracles for you. Well, you love him first. And then the second thing you've got to do is get into this love walk. Because without love, and of course without faith, you can't see him do nothing. But Galatians chapter 5 verse 6 says that your faith works through or by love. So if you don't walk in love, I mean, I'll tell you a little story. I'm talking about, talking about man and wife a while ago. I was at a party one night with a bunch of Christians, and the deacon the chairman of deacons was there and his wife, and they had a little conflict. And she said a couple of things I didn't think glorified God or her husband, so I got her over to the side and I told her, I said, look, your husband's chairman of deacons, you know, and what you just done, you know, did not glorify God. I said, didn't glorify your husband either. I said, you know, you need to repent and tell God you're sorry. And she said, well, okay, I, I know I didn't do it right. I said, now you know what you're supposed to do? I said, you're supposed to go over there and call your husband Lord and tell him you're sorry. She said, I will never call him Lord. I said, if you don't, you're a disobedient daughter to God, and right now your prayers will be cut off, and until you get right with your husband, you will never get another prayer answered. She said, that's not in the scripture. I said, oh, you go home tonight and read the book of First and Second Peter. There's a whole lot of things in those two books you need. I'm not going to tell you which one is in or which chapter is in. But I said, you go home and read it, and you're going to find it. Where he tells you clearly, if you want to be his daughter, you will call your husband Lord. You will honor him and respect him. And if you do that, he says, you are my daughters indeed. Now, see, that's the king talking through one of his apostles. Now, how many of you ladies in here have ever called your husband Lord? Very few of you. Very few. But if God told you to do it, why do you not do it? I'm serious. You want your marriage to be great? You want your marriage to be great? Then the husband's got to love his wife like this. If the husband loves his wife like God loved the church, willing to give his life for her, he said, then your prayers won't be hindered. He said, you come and ask me for anything and I'll do it for you. But then he tells the woman, you were to also to love that husband. You were to be subject to him. You know, and this is where so many women fail. The husband, she may come to him and say, we need to talk. Okay, so we sat down and talk about something. And whenever we get through talking, he says, okay, I've heard your input. I've thought about it. 
this is what we're going to do. And he makes a decision. He said, this is what we're going to do. Now, she may not agree with it, but if she doesn't agree with what his decision is, she is to go with his decision because he is the spiritual leader in the house. Now, if she retaliates against him and says, no, I don't like your decision, I'm not going to do it your way. She's in direct rebellion to him and to God. And her prayers are going to be cut off. She's not going to be, she's not going to be hurt. Because she's not walking in obedience to the word. Now then, if she says, okay, honey, you're the spiritual leader of the home. I love you. You made the decision. I may not agree with it, but we're going to go with it because you're the spiritual leader and God holds you responsible for every decision that's made in this home. And he does. He holds them in. The monkey's off of your back. But the monkey's never off of the man's back. God made us the spiritual authorities in our home, and he's going to hold us accountable for the wife and the children and meeting their needs. And every man will stand accountable for his family. Boy, that's scary. When you think about that, that's scary. But see, when you do it his way and read his word and do what he says, then he'll bless your socks off, and he'll answer your prayers. But he says here, when we rejoice not in iniquity, but rejoice in the truth, Love bears all things, it believes all things, it hopes all things, it endures all things. Love never fails. When you walk into God kind of love, how often will it fail? Never. never. That's exactly right. Now then, we go back to Hebrews 13. And now then, where he says, now then, in Hebrews 13, 1, Continue to love each other with true Christian love or the God kind of love. Now then, you could read that one line, and if you don't know what 1 Corinthians 13, the first seven verses say, you don't know how to walk there. You don't know how to walk there. But the thing about it is, if you're walking, if you're reading the word, continue to love each other with the true Christian love or the God kind of love, then when you read that line, if you don't know what that true Christian love is, then you need to go back into the Word to find out what that is. And so when you go back to 1 Corinthians 13, the first seven verses, it will tell you what is required to meet the criteria of that one line in Hebrews 13.1. So you see it's a whole lot more involved than just reading a line. It requires doing what he says. Now, if you and I don't do what the king says, do you think we can ever do anything that he does not know what we're doing? No. I mean, you think about this. You go home this afternoon and strip your clothes off to step in the shower. Who steps in the shower with you? Jesus. You go home and say something to your spouse. If they're a born-again Christian, if I say something to Cheryl, guess who I'm talking to, really? Jesus, because our king is in her. If she's talking to me, who's she talking to? Jesus. Now, there's times for both of us, just like you, if you were going to say something to either maybe a brother or sister in Christ or your own mate, if you were going to say something, and if you were a little upset and you were fixing to say something you know you shouldn't have to say or not supposed to say, and if you stepped up to him to say something and outstepped Jesus right in front of you, I guarantee you'd change what you were fixing to do. We're going to walk, continue to love each other with a true Christian love. Then he said, don't forget to show hospitality to strangers. Somebody said, I ain't going to show no hospitality to a stranger. They come by, I'm not even going to talk to them. Well, look, the Lord says, don't forget to show hospitality to strangers. For some who have done this have entertained angels without realizing it. Can you imagine what it would be like? In fact, I think about this story, and I, it's been told so many times, I assume it's true. At least it happened to somebody. I know God could very easily do this. So there was a, and some of you I'm sure have heard this, it's usually around a lot at Christmas to get emails with it on it. It said this man had been told that the Lord Jesus was going to come to his house this evening for dinner. And he went out and took the little bit of money that he had and bought the finest foods and things he could get. 
and he fixed a meal. He was not a wealthy man by no means, but he took what he had and bought what he could, and he fixed the most beautiful dinner because he heard Jesus was coming by his house. And a little while, a knock on the door, and a little poor lady that needed something to eat. And he thought, oh my gosh, I ain't got time for her. I mean, Jesus is coming to my house. But he thought, I could never turn her away. So he goes in and gets part of the food and stuff and brings in and gives it to her and tells her, ma'am, you know, here, this is the best I can do. I can help you out here. Well, before the evening was over, he had like three or four visitors come to his door. By 10 o'clock that night, the last one come and he'd given away the last bit of food. There was not anything left to eat. And he thought, oh, God, Lord, what am I going to do? If you show up now, I ain't got nothing to give you. And the Lord spoke to him and told him, he said, four times tonight I came to your house. And four times you fed me. As often as you do this to the least of these, my brethren, you have done it to me. See, that's the part we miss. We miss Christ in you. We fail to see Christ in each other. I think we need to start walking in this God kind of love. So when we see another brother or sister, we see Jesus. So that we can love them. So that we can not condemn them. If there's anything we do in this church as well as every church in, in the world that we as people need to start walking in a godlier love with people. When you talk to people, talk to them gentle in love. Don't run them, throw your finger in their face and start condemning them. Walk in love. You want your prayers to be answered? I do. Then God says we're supposed to walk in this kind of love. Is it difficult to walk there? Yeah. Is it difficult for me to walk there? Yeah. It really is. But I'm trying to learn. Amen. I'm trying to learn how to walk in that love. I don't care what happens to me. I don't care what anybody says to me. I don't care what happens. I'm going to walk in the God kind of love. Amen. You know? I'm not a... I'm not perfect. I'm a human being, and I still make mistakes. But Cheryl and I, we, I told her here a while back, I said, honey, I'm turning over a new leaf. I, she had never heard that term. But that's, that's something. I heard it. I heard you say Oh, okay. <laughs> but she said, but anyway, I, I told her I'm turning over a new leaf, and I meant that. You know, I, I, I want that leaf to be turned over in the God kind of love so that all the time when I deal with you or I deal with her or anyone else I deal with, I want them to see Jesus in me. I don't want them to see me. I want them to see our king. And I want them to think when they come up and talk to me, I want to have that love and that glow of God about me so that they don't see me, but they see Jesus. So if you see Jesus when you come, he's the one you're coming to get the touch from. And if you see him, then he will touch you and you will get it. And if you come to me and expect me to do it for you, you think, if I could just get Thurman to pray for me, I know I could be healed. Well, if you see Jesus in me, then that's when it's going to happen. But as long as you're looking to me as your provider, it's not going to happen. But you've got to see that Jesus. And if you and I can walk in that God kind of love, and remember, he said, continue in that love. All the time, 24-7. Not at church. It's a whole lot easier to do it at church than it is at home or in a restaurant or somewhere else. But, you know, we obviously can do it. And just think, if just this little group of people right here, if we could walk in that God kind of love, 24-7, where we go in the course of a week, you know the impact we could have on this world. We, Tom, we could have some kind of impact, couldn't we, sir? There ain't no telling how many people we could touch. No telling. But whenever, you know, lots of people have heard this, oh, Thurman, he's a Christian? Wow, if that's what a Christian is, I don't want nothing to do with Christians. 
You ever heard people say those kind of things about people? He goes to church. Wow, you'd never know it at work. He tells the same dirty jokes everybody else does. He cusses like a sailor. If that's what it, he even runs around on his wife. If that's what it takes to be a Christian, forget that nonsense. I don't want to be like him. See, that should never be said about a Christian, should it, Ernest? Never. Everybody ought to say, there's something unique about you. I mean, I ain't never seen nobody that glows like you do. What is it about you? You say, well, I know Jesus. I knew it. That had to be what it was. See, that's where we should live, isn't it, young lady? We should live there all the time. If we live there, you know what the king said in John 15, 7? He said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, then you can ask him for what? You think he meant that, Sharon? You know he did, doesn't you? don't you? Yes, you know. And you know that too, don't you, Ernest? He says, ask me for anything and I will do it. You know, I love giving God the glory, but I... I, I You'll never know, of course, I'll never know what it meant to them, but I know what it meant to me when they brought their granddaughter in here with that breast cancer or whatever she had, and I prayed for her and God healed her. Amen. And then a little while later when Ernest brought his lovely wife Esther up, and I got to pray for her, and the Lord healed her too. Amen. You know, you never, you can never imagine what that does to me to think, I got to pray the prayer pray for them two women and change their life forever. Amen. But to change the family's life forever. And just think, if we walk in that God kind of love, he'll do that for you. And he'll do it for every one of us. And therefore, as we walk across this country in that God kind of love, we touch people. God will touch people and he will do signs and miracles and wonders beyond your wildest dreams. But you got to walk in that love. Amen. Get out of that condemning mode and start walking in love. Just like that great story. I'm going to tell this and then we're going to quit for the day. But I think about this family that came here and they came here for quite a while and they had four little children. And the children listened intensively to what I taught from God's Word. And then one day the mother come up here and said, I have a testimony. I said, yes ma'am, what is it? She said, this last week my husband was out of town. She said, we got out on, I think it was Tuesday. She said, I homeschool my children. So on Tuesday, we said, had to go somewhere. And my husband's going to be out of town all week. We went out and got in the car and hit the starter. And it just said, uh, uh, and that's all it would do. And immediately the children said, Mama, let's pray. So one of the little children prayed and asked the father in Jesus' name to fix the car. And said, okay, Mama, now I guarantee it'll start. <laughs> And Mama said, I reached up and hit the starter, and it started just like that. And said it ran perfect all day. Said so the next morning, but we were going to have to go somewhere else, and the car did the same thing. And one of the other ones said, Mama, my time to pray. And they prayed and guaranteed Mama it would start, and it started. And the third morning, the same thing happened, and it did the same thing. And the third one prayed, and it started. And the fourth morning, it did the same thing on Friday. She had called her husband and told her the car is giving trouble. And he said, well, I won't be home until Friday night, but it, if y'all can keep it running, I'll fix it Friday when I get home. So Friday, they go out there and get in the car and hit the starter, and it does the same thing. And the other said, okay, it's my time to pray. And the last one prayed. Said, now, Mama, I guarantee it will start. She reached up and nothing. Nothing. And he looked around the car and he said, okay. Who in this car has got unconfessed sin in your life? <laughs> he said, don't you remember Pastor Thurman said, God don't answer prayers of sinners. So he said, is somebody in this car has got unconfessed sin in your life? Now let's find out who it is. And the little girl said, I hit my brother last night and I didn't repent. So Lord, I'm sorry I hit him. And the little boy said, and I got angry with my little sister last night and I didn't ask God to forgive me. And so they all got their sins repented of. And then the little boy that had prayed that nothing happened, he said, are we sure everybody's got all sins <laughs> repented of? And they all assured. And then Mama says, I got a little short with Daddy last night too, so I've got to repent. Now she told this story right here. 
It's on tape. Some of you were here that day and heard it. She said, I repented to it. I asked the Lord to forgive me for getting sharp with my husband. And now, she said, now I believe all of our sins are repented of. He said, okay. Now, Father, in Jesus' name, that we've repented of all of our sins. Now we stand on your word, and we ask you to start the car, and we thank you. Now, Mama, I guarantee it'll start. She said, I reached her, hit that starter, and it started perfect. In Jesus' name. Is that an awesome testimony? I mean, faith gave that story, that testimony, right here in this church. And that day, she told it. I had several pastors here that day. And I looked out, and those pastors that were here, they were on their knees out on the floor confessing their sins to God. You know, you think God don't know our sin? Yes, he knows our sin. And does his word really work? Yes, it really works. So when we get all of our sins repented of, and we stand on the word, then God hears, and he answers our prayer.